أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم to our in-person audience and our virtual audience we're here uh, for a special occasion which we will uh, detail in a minute but we're going to begin with a, a prayer Allahi min shaitani rajim Bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Ar-Rahman rahim Malik yawm al-deen Iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in Iddina sirat al-mustakim Sirat al-ladina an'amta alayhim Ghayb al-mandub alayhim wa al-dallin Ameen Alhamdulillah Welcome again to our virtual and our in-person audience for this uh, special uh, occasion uh, and uh, it has been uh, accompanied by several ironies. Uh, I just had a visit from a friend of mine who I haven't seen in many, many years, who actually lives uh, in the Baltimore area, and he used to play for the Baltimore uh, Bullets, as they used to call them. Uh, he was a, a great player, and at uh, one time I think he had at least one uh, all-star appearance. And so uh, he came surprisingly today and uh, it was a very very good uh, a very good visit and of course many of you probably saw last night one of the great uh, football games of recent memory in which uh, the team from Baltimore uh, scored a, a, a surprising victory in the last few seconds over uh, perhaps even a greater team from Kansas City and this was a very, very uh, exciting and a memorable uh, athletic competition. Uh, but tonight we have uh, probably a, a double blessing, and we don't want to over overhype it. A bit, but tonight we'll be speaking about something that's more important than everything I just mentioned. Uh, so the the topic tonight is high: the blueprint of the development of the soul, and. Uh, the title of the book is Hodge, the Blueprint of the Development of the Soul. And we have a double blessing because we not only have one, not only have one Safi Rob, we have two Safi Robs. And so, <laughs> so we're going to bring forward uh, Safi Rob Al Asgar, uh, the younger Safi Rob, and he's going to introduce Safi Rob Al Akbar, inshallah. <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Nashadu anna ilaha illallah Wahdahu la sharika la Nashadu anna Muhammad and abduhu wa rasulah With Allah's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer We bear witness there is no God or deity worthy of worship Other than the one that created every thing in existence and we bear witness that Muhammad the Prophet, the prayers and the peace be upon Muhammad the Prophet, is the servant and messenger of Almighty God Allah. Good evening to everyone here in Oakland, uh, in Mexico, Guadalupe, which is a place that, uh, of course, holds a special place in my heart. It's where I, I met my wife and got married. Uh, and I uh, have. Um, I come back and find a, a reason to come back to the West Coast. And it's a special, a special place because it's a place that uh, Imam Warfadi Muhammad, our leader and teacher, he used to live here, was at one point the resident man here. And, uh, you know, Imam Al-Qadir Al-Amin was here. And Imam Fahim Shuey was now here. And uh, all of them have been students consistent soldiers in the faith and working hard to save our people. So I, I find more than one occasion to come back and forth to the West Coast. And, um, and on this particular occasion, I feel especially honored to be able to accompany my father, who is here in Oakland with me together. And he is 
really on a, a, a promotional uh, presentation tour and available to come wherever you are. I think this is his life's mission. This is what he's told me. So I'm, I'm introducing him the way he talks to me. But I'd like to say a couple of things about my father. My father is a person who joined the Nation of Islam under the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh, and at the time, Minister Clyde Rahman was the minister in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, he stayed in the organization clean until at some time, at some point, the ministers had changed. The minister became Minister Louis Omar, uh, who's, who's popularly known. He passed away. Yeah, my father is, is uh, one of the people, as a student of Imam Warthi Muhammad, ultimately, who, uh, following his time in, in the Nation of Islam, as the captain in Baltimore, worked hard to establish Islam, Al-Islam, the school, many businesses, efforts in Baltimore City, and, and uh, most notably for, for me and my siblings, uh, gave us the most precious gift outside of life itself that he could give to us, along with my mother, which is the gift of Al-Islam. And uh, guiding us, teaching us, helping us to understand me, my, my younger sister Intasar, my older brother Yusuf, older sister Salima, Akil, all, all of our, our siblings, we, are, uh, we, we really took a lot of guidance from our father, from my father. And he spent a lot of time research, researching what I would say is probably one of the most least emphasized and least understood pillars of Al-Islam, and that is the Hajj the fifth pillar of Al-Islam. And many people do it. They, they know that Muhammad the Prophet, the prayers and peace be upon him, did it. But why is it a pillar of Al-Islam? Why is it something important for us to do? I would encur encourage everyone to uh, tune in and take notes. He has a lot to say about it. He's going to come up in one second and also get his book. Uh, I don't know if he'll say this. I think they normally go for $20, but he's donated all of them to the masjid. So you can get, if you're here, you can have one for free. But if you feel so inclined, make your contribution to the masjid. Uh, and and uh, I heard Sister Nisad said say that uh, you know you can make you can make a monetary contribution, and she likes the kind that that uh, folds, not jingles. <laughs> so, so without further ado, I'm gonna uh, bring my father, Safir Rob to um, introduce his book, Hajj, From Adam to Abraham. As-salamu alaykum. As-salamu alaykum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim maliki ar-Rahim. Ashadu an la ilaha ila wa watuhu la shibika lahu wa ashadu an muhammad ar wa wa rasulu. I am honored to be able to come and speak to you about the fifth pillar of Al-Islam, better known as Hajj. The subject has been promoted as Hajj as a blueprint for the development of the soul. And I would like to reinforce the promotion by saying this is what it is. Hajj is known to most of the believers as the fifth pillar of Al-Islam. And what I'm going to talk to you about is not so much the ritual in as much as uh, the ritual is very, very important. But you can get the ritual on possibly any publication on Hodge. What I would like to do is shine some light on the meaning of the ritual as it serves as a blueprint for the development of the soul. Hodge is better known as the fifth pillar of Al-Islam. 
And when we look at the rites of Hajj, most people think of it as a trip to Mecca or Saudi Arabia. Well, I would just like to highlight that Hajj is not just a trip, but it is a prescription for how to live our Islamic lives. When we rehearse the rites of Hajj, we actually are giving principles on how we should govern ourselves every day. The highlight of the Hajj is better known as Arafat. Arafat is better known as Hajj, which is the place where we go on the ninth of Dil Hijra. Dil Hijra is the 12th month of the Islamic calendar. So on the ninth day of the 12th month of the Islamic calendar, we should spend that on Arafat. The Prophet said that if you spend the ninth of Dil Hijra on Arafat, and do not get to participate in the other rites of Hajj, you are considered to have made Hajj. And if you go to Saudi Arabia and do all the other rituals, but do not spend the night of Dil Hijra on Arafat, you have not made Hajj. So in a nutshell, Hajj is Arafat, and Arafat is Hajj. We're going to highlight a little bit why that is important. First of all, Arafat got its name from the place where Adam and Eve met once they were put out of paradise. They said Arafat means to know with respect to God. So Adam met Eve, and I think more importantly, Eve met Adam. And both of them recognized each other as mates intended for one another by Allah. The question becomes is why is this the highlight of the Hajj and the most important aspect of the Hajj? That's an intelligent question if that's what you're asking. We all know that when we go to participate in the rites of Hajj, we go around the Kaaba seven times. We go between Safa and Marwa seven times. And then there's a, a point where we practice stoning the Jimaret seven times. Three uh, Jimarets. So we should be asking ourselves, if we do all these things, why is Arafat more important than these things? And the reason I'm going to attempt to answer that question for you, that's the reason why I'm posing that. I want you to consider it. Arafat is the place where Adam met Eve and Eve met Adam. More importantly, the prophet said that if you, one of the most wicked people, is one who participates in the rites of Hajj and spend the night of Dil Hijra on Arafat and do not believe all of their sins are forgiven. So, there's another hadith that says that if you spend the night of the Hijra on Arafat, all of your sins is forgiven from the time you were born to that particular time. You have the sins of a newborn baby on your account. We should not look at Adam and Eve as just two biologies, the first two biologies that Allah made. I like to use the language of Imam W.D. Muhammad, and that is, they represent the masculine and the feminine aspect of our human potential. 
Adam and Eve is in, in each and every one of us. We know our biology is made from a sperm and an ovum, which is masculine and feminine. But I'd like to point out to you that that's just a sign of the making of the real you. When Imam Muhammad became our leader, he said, man means mind. And we should not look at what we see in the mirror as man. We should look at what is evolving through what we see in the mirror as mind. And that's what we call the soul of the human potential. When Adam and Eve was put out of paradise, it is said that Adam came down someplace in India and Eve came down someplace in the Arabian Peninsula and they met at Arafat. Arafat is not within the sacred precincts. It's just outside of the sacred precincts. But when they met, recognized one another, we should see this as the first marriage. And they cohabitated in the earth as they lived the rest of their lives. But they knew that they were going to live their lives in a way that was not going to listen to Satan. Because he was the one who got them put out. So now the stage is set. Hajj really was the life that they lived earning their way back to paradise. They cohabitated together in the earth so that they could go back to Allah for the pleasure of Allah. This is important to every individual who attends Arafat on the night of the Jil of the Hijra because the masculine and the feminine aspect of our human potential is better known as our faith and our desires. Hawa actually means desires. We know Hawa as Eve in English, but it's also the desires within us. And the leadership of our human potential is our faith, as Imam Muhammad puts it. When Allah says, I'm going to place a Khalifa in the earth, we should not see it as the making of Adam and Eve in paradise, but we should see it as the making of Adam and Eve in the earth. They weren't made until they were put out of paradise. So we need to get our mind out of thinking paradise was where Adam and Eve was made. Paradise is where the potential of Adam and Eve was made. When they were made, they were told, do not eat from this tree. And they ate from the tree. Moses and Adam was arguing. And Moses told Adam, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have to go through this. So Adam asked Moses, did you not reveal the Torah to Bani Israel? He said, yes. He said, how many years was it written before it was given to me to give to Bani Israel? And Naji says it was probably 60,000 years. So it was already written that Adam would eat from the tree. The prophet said, Moses dropped his head because Adam got the best of it. Now, what are we saying? What we're saying is that when Adam and Eve ate from the tree and they were put out of paradise and they were placed in the earth, this gives meaning to Surah 2, Ayat 30, where Allah says, I'm going to place a Khalifa in the earth. He didn't say, I'm going to place a Khalifa in paradise. In the earth. So when Adam and Eve met, this was the beginning of the human potential recognizing that it's no longer going to listen to Satan. I now see my partner in life and we are going to 
perform the things that we do for the pleasure of Allah. And this is what Hajj is. Hajj is not going to Mecca and performing the rituals. Hajj is living the life of the meaning of those rituals as we live our everyday life. Now, once we go to Mecca, dealing with the ritual, the ritual of Hajj, we start on the 8th of Del Hijra, which is the day before the night. And this day is known as the day of doubt. This day is the day that we prepare ourselves for the ritual that we're going to embark on for the next five days. Hajj, the rituals of Hajj begins with it lasts six days, the 8th, 9th, and 10th, which is the day of doubt. Arafat means the day of knowledge. And the 10th of Dil Hijra, we all know it as Eid Du Adha, but it's also the day of execution. We're going to highlight the day of doubt dealing with Adam. We're going to deal with Abraham, and we're going to deal with Prophet Muhammad. When we look at Adam being in paradise, not knowing what the influence of Satan would be on his life, not knowing is a form of doubt. When you know, you no longer have doubt. Knowledge is the elimination of the doubt. So we will look at the period of the time that Adam and Eve lived in paradise. This was creating the, the state of not knowing. What was it that they did not know? They did not know the influence of Satan in their lives. When they were put out of paradise, they met at Arafat on the ninth of the Hijra, when this is when they came into knowledge. Arafat means to know. So now they knew they were mates intended for one another and they were no longer going to listen to Satan. They were going to live their lives seeking the pleasure of Allah, not listening to the influence of Satan. The rest of their lives is the same thing as the tenth of the Hijra because they executed seeking the pleasure of Allah. When the prophet Abraham received a dream that he should sacrifice his son, he went to his son and said, I see in a dream that I should sacrifice you. What do you see? Ishmael told him, to hear is to obey. But to the mere fact that he asked Ishmael mean he had doubts. The dream now was confirmed to him when he got it the second time. So the second time he received the dream, he got the confirmation, and that represents knowledge. The next thing he did was took Ishmael up the trail to sacrifice him, which was better known as the tenth of the Hijra, or the execution of that dream. Prophet Muhammad agonized over the condition of his people. He had no idea of why his people were worshiping idols. He used to go up into the cave of Hera and pray to Allah. He used to fast and pray and ask Allah for knowledge about his people. This was a form of not knowing. He received the first revelation in the cave of Herod, which was the beginning of the day of knowledge in his life. And it was confirmed 23 years later on the day of Arafat, where Allah revealed this day, I have chosen for you Islam as your deen. 
when that when that revelation was revealed, it was when the when the prophet was performing Hajj on the ninth of the Hijrah. So we should look at the twenty-three years of the revealing of the Holy Quran to Prophet Muhammad as the day of knowledge. Then the rest of the community, who is me and you, are supposed to execute what that knowledge is. Hajj should not be looked at as just a ritual that we perform, but it should be looked at as a blueprint for how we should govern ourselves every day. When Abraham was taking Ishmael up the trail to sacrifice him, the angel, not the angel, the beast came to him. He said, where you going, man? He said, up the trail to get some firewood for my family. He said, you shouldn't go up there because you know you think God told you to kill your son. You shouldn't do that. And Abraham recognized who he was and said, get out of my life, Iblis. He said, I know who you are. Get lost. So Iblis knew he didn't have a win with Abraham, so he went to Ishmael. He said, young man, where are you going? He said, up the trail with my father. Get some firewood. He said, you better not go up there. That man lost his mind. He think he's supposed to sacrifice you. Ismael said, well, if that's what he think his Lord told him to hear is to obey. So then he went to Hagar because he had no wind with Ismael. He said, Hagar, where's your husband and your son? He said, they went to get some firewood. He said, you better go catch him. The man that lost his mind think he's supposed to sacrifice his son. I think God told him to do it. She said, if God told him to do it, he is to obey. So he had no win with either one of them, Abraham, Hagar, or Ishmael. The reason why I'm bringing this out is because this is why we stone three Gemirats. Each one of them represents the resistance of Satan. They rejected him. And we throw seven stones And go around the Kaaba seven times and go between Safai and Mawa seven times to represent seven examples of faith. Holy Quran says we should make no distinction between any of the prophets because they are all sent by the same Creator. Things equal to the same things are equal to each other. Meaning that if Adam represents the creator, if Jesus represents the creator, if Moses represents the creator, Abraham represents the creator, they all represent the same thing, which is the creator. So they're equal to one another. Therefore, we should not make any distinction between any of the prophets. Why do I bring this out? Because when the prophet made his ascension, he went through seven heavens. In the first heaven, he saw Adam. On the second heaven, he saw Jesus and Yahya. On the third, he saw Yusuf. On the fourth, he saw Idris, the fifth, Harun, the sixth, Musa, and the seventh, he saw Abraham. Each one of these prophets represents an example of faith. So we should not look at it as a rank of one higher than the other, but we should look at it as an example of faith to incorporate in our own being. Allah says that I have created the heavens in seven firmaments, and the same is within you. So when we look at when the prophet made his ascension into the heavens, he saw an example of faith from one of his brothers. And this is the same thing we should see in the seven levels of our own human potential. We should see it as an example of faith, of how we should be executing our lives every day. Now, when we look at going around the Kaaba seven times, we should also be mindful of these seven levels. 
The Kaaba was built by Abraham and Ismael. What is the Kaaba? It is a place set aside for the worship, the focus of the worship of Allah. So when we look at who built the Kaaba, which is Abraham and Ismael, who represents rational, religious understanding and unquestionable faith. Since they were the builders of the physical Kaaba on the planet Earth, we should let Abraham and Ismael and us build our Kaaba. What do I mean by that? It means your rational religious understanding and your unquestionable faith should be constructing the Kaaba within your heart, which is the focus for the worship of Allah. The prophet said that the reason why we go between Safa and Mawa is to represent Hagar looking for water for her son, Ismael, once Abraham left her in the desert. When Abraham left her, she was alone. And uh, she said, where you going, man? You gonna leave us in this desert by ourselves? He said, then he didn't answer. And she asked him, did your Lord tell you to do this? He said, yes. He said, then go ahead. You'll take care of us. So after she went back and forth between Safa and Mawa seven times, she came back to the well, well, to Ishmael, and she, she saw the angel Gabriel tapping the well of Zamzam. And the reason why I'm bringing it out like this is because we should let our Hagar, meaning the community of self, our desires, in us, look beneath the feet of our faith, in it, even in its embryonic state, to sustain our lives. That's what water represents. And we should be incorporating this in our everyday life, in our everyday thought. Every time we think, we should be thinking about Hajj in the sense of what the ritual actually represents to the human potential. Once we go to Mecca, we should not look at uh, Umrah as Hajj. What I just explained to you was Umrah. That's going around the Kaaba seven times and going between Safa and Mawa. That is what we call Umrah. Hajj is what I said earlier. It's the tending the ninth of the Hijra on Arafat. So, and there was a Gazwa where the prophet uh, told his companions they had just finished raiding a caravan and they, they considered it a minor jihad and the prophet said now that you have performed the minor jihad you may join us in the major jihad which is the Hajj of life, the struggle against evil. That's pretty much what Hajj means to struggle against evil. What we want to represent to you is all of the aspects of the rites of Hajj so that it does not become just a ritual. It becomes a knowledge that we can employ in our everyday lives and live it every day. And I'm hoping that's what I've just explained to you with respect to the rights of Hajj. We have a book that we wrote where we go into the details of the rights of Hajj and we use what we call a quadrilateral approach with this book. And what we mean by quadrilateral is four sides. 
One is, what does Allah say to us about the rights of Hajj in the Holy Quran? Each aspect about the rights of Hajj is spelled out in the Quran. The books tell you where to find it. The next thing is, what did the Prophet do when he made Hajj? Which is the same as, what is the Sunnah with respect to Hajj? The third is that Hajj existed before the Prophet was born. He didn't invent Hajj. They were already practicing Hajj when he came into this world, when his body came into this world. And in the practice of the Hajj, we find that the history associated with it is centered around Adam and Eve, Abraham, Hagar, and Ismael. So what's the history associated with the rites of Hajj? And thirdly, how does this help me with the development of my soul? How is this going to get me paradise? And this is something that we should be uh, looking for. This is what I'm sure everybody looks for. Personally, when I went on Hajj, it was 41 years ago, the first time, and I didn't understand. I had no idea. So I said, well, I, I'm going to try to find a way to uh, get the meaning of this and then help others get the meaning. And this is what I'm doing now. I would like for you to try to take note from what I've just presented to you and read the book, please. Do your homework, do your research, but if you follow this prescription of the book, I think I did a uh, halfway decent job on trying to give it to you. Now we spell out the details, we spell out the rights, and we, we give you the do's and don'ts, when to wear, when to take a bath, when to put on perfume, when to shave, and do all those things. But those are details that almost anybody can teach you, and, I, and I'm not saying don't reference anybody else. Please do. Reference anybody. But what I wanted to give you, I'm going to say with the WD factor, <laughs> which is the part that is for a prescription for the development of our souls. We need to, we need to know these things. And this is what, uh, and I would like to also say that uh, Imam Muhammad was going to take 2,000 people on Hajj in 2001. Well, in the year 2000, I wrote articles in the Muslim Journal, which was extracts from this book. Imam Muhammad made a public address. He told the community that he intends to take 2,000 people next year. And in order to prepare the people, we're writing articles every week in the Muslim Journal. These were the articles that I was writing with his sanction and with his blessings. And when he made that statement, I knew I had his blessings. <laughs> he said he wanted everybody to read these articles. We wrote those articles for 11 months. So I'm just reiterating uh, that we have Imam Muhammad sanctioning with this. He had a copy of the book then. And I just wrote ex excerpts from the book and, as articles in the Muslim Journal. If you were around, then you, you, you may remember that. But it was in the year 2000. Having said that, I have uh, one more aspect that I would like to highlight to you about uh, Adam and Abraham, which is something that Imam Muhammad told us. They are considered our fathers. Adam is the father of our human potential, and Abraham is the father of our faith. So we should look at them as the examples of focus of how we intend to govern our lives. Having said that, I would just like to encourage everyone to take a copy of the book, read the book, and uh, I will, the book is yours as a gift from me and my wife. 
And the uh, uh, reason why I'm adding my wife into this is because she's the one who published it, and she just passed away three weeks ago. And so I would like, if you would want to make a contribution to the mass, they do it on her behalf. She gets the benefits. So having said that, I would just like to open if there's any questions. Question. Yes, ma'am. You said you uh, went to Hong for the first time uh, 41 years ago? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember the group that you lived with, like other individuals? I mean, not, not specifically like the names, but the, the people that attended with you. Were they mothers? Were they fathers? Were they teenagers? Do you remember like the demographic of the group that you attended? I can by? tell you it was, a, it was a small group okay. from America, maybe about 30. And I would have to say, I remember one, it was six people from Baltimore, which is where I was from. But it was about 30 from the United States. And one of them was Imam Yahya Abdullah. And he was talking about Hajj, something that Imam Muhammad, and he had heard Imam Muhammad say. And that's what really let me know that it was something else to this. Because I didn't know anything he said. So I, I, I should give credit to him for giving me the inspiration to do more research. So that, that's about all I can tell you about the group. But it, was, it wasn't that many. It was about 30, 30 people from the United States at that time. We were the guest of Rabbitah. We were still under, under that, um, that same uh, guest where we paid the transportation and they gave us the uh, Okay. The venue and accommodations. Yes. That was my next question. Do you remember how much it cost to go? Fifteen hundred dollars. Sorry, say again. Fifteen hundred dollars. Forty-one years ago, fifteen hundred dollars. That's right. Do you have any like uh, mementos from that time still from your first trip to Hajj? Like any, I don't know. Anything? The only thing I can remember was bringing back some of that Saudi Arabian money and Safia. <laughs> He used to use it every, week, every year on show and tell whenever he went to school. <laughs> but uh, no, that was it. The, I think the main thing that I remember was Imam Yahya telling me something that Imam Muhammad told him, and I had no clue. That was my inspiration to do more research. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, I would like to thank you for this most excellent presentation. I was well presented, well organized, very comprehensive. And I pray that Allah continue to bless you in your efforts to help us understand the meaning of Hajj physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I do appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Oh, you're quite welcome. I'm, I am honored to be able to uh, share this with you. And uh, I intend to do it a lot more and because there is a lot more. I could talk about Hodge from now till the end of time. <laughs> and I just, I, I, I'm appreciative that you have expressed your appreciation because I don't know, if you don't tell me, I won't know. Thank you. Other questions? Sound like me, man, Fahim? Sister see Yolanda? Good to see you back. Okay, I'll ask you a question. What would be, out of all the what would be one that you would highlight, and what would be the practical application of that in our, in our everyday life? Just, just one. I know it's a lot, but whatever one comes up. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you one. I'm going to, I'm going to veer off a little bit because I seem like I have a little bit more time. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to explain it to you from a, a different perspective. Okay. And that is the highlight of the Hajj is the Arafat. Right. When Allah says, "I'm going to uh, make a Khalifa in the earth." He had dispatched the angel Gabriel and told him to bring me the essence of the earth so that I could fashion man into shape. 
And the angel Gabriel came to the earth, and the earth says, I seek refuge with Allah from you disfiguring me. And so the angel Gabriel answered the dua of the earth rather than obey the commandment of Allah. So then he, he went back to Allah and says, I would have brought you the essence that you commanded me, but your servant, who I know is a righteous servant, sought refuge in your name. So I answered his prayer. So then he sent the angel Michael. And he did the same thing. And he sent another angel, and another angel, and another angel. He kept sending angels. Till finally he sent Israfiel. And the earth told Israfiel, I seek refuge with Allah from you disfiguring me. And Israfiel said, I seek refuge with Allah from what he would do to me if I don't obey his command. He began to take the essence. And so he, he, they said he took some of each type of essence and took it back to Allah so he could fashion man into shape. And that's what he did. Allah says, because you have obeyed my command, I'm going to give you a promotion. You will be known as the deaf angel. So now the deaf angel has his post, which is to extract the essence. I think that's very important to remember, and I want you to keep in mind that I'm answering your question, what was the most important part about Hajj? I'm getting to it, but I gotta lay the foundation first. Yeah. <laughs> now, when the prophet was on his deathbed, deaf angel knocked on his door, and he asked the angel Gabriel, who's knocking at my door? He said, it is one of Allah's servants. And he has under his command 100,000 angels. And each one of them have under their command 100,000 angels. Prophecy, <laughs> tell him to come in. He comes in, he says, I've come to see if you are ready to meet your Lord. The prophet said, did you normally ask? He said, no. And after you? I will never ask again. The angel Gabriel told Prophet Muhammad, your Lord is anxious to meet you. So the deaf angel, he said, do what you've come to do. The reason why I pointed that out, because I did the math. 100,000 times 100,000 is 10 billion. I ain't even 10 billion people on the planet. What you need with that many deaf angels? I concluded, and I'm giving you this as Sophia's opinion, that I do know that angels exist in tribes. So I believe just like there's a jinn assigned to each one of us, there's the Ruh, which is a member of the tribe of the angel Gabriel assigned to each one of us. I think there's a deaf angel assigned to each one of us. But I don't think he's ending our life. I think he's taking the essence out of our deeds, out of our thoughts, out of our actions, as we perform them every day. I don't think it just comes at the end. I think he's with us all of the time. Why do I bring that point out? It's because we should be mindful that when Adam and Eve meet at Arafat, that's the faith and our desires within us. This piece of earth is where they meet. And I'm gonna tell you something else, another ayah, where Allah, when he put them out of paradise, he said, get thee down from here with enmity between you. And that bothered me. I said, wait a minute, I can see how enmity can be between Satan and Adam and Eve. Well, he said, all of you. And the words of Allah is good for all times. And I thought about it. I said, you know what? I am not trying to promote enmity between a husband and a wife. But I can actually see that if we don't look at two physical beings and look at our desires and our faith, they're not aligned. Our desires is more things of this world. Our desires is money, opposite sex, power, glory, 
other things. It's not a law. We have to align our desires with our faith. They need to get married. And I know Amen. she always talks a lot about marriage. <laughs> so, so I'm pretty sure he's going to be telling you all that more about this. But what I'm saying is the real marriage is the one within. It's the human potential of our faith and our desires. Now why am I saying that? Because I'm going back to Arafat. When, we, when they meet one another and recognize one another and cohabitate in this earth so they can live now, not with enmity between them, but for the pleasure of Allah. And that that man do is extracting the essence. This is the making of man. Man, like I said, wasn't made in paradise. The potential of man was made in paradise. The real man is made in the earth. I'm going to draw another analogy, and since we have the time, I think we can explain this. When we're in the womb of our mothers, the sperm and the ovum, which is the masculine and the feminine, meet, and they go through a process called mitosis, and they split, they split, they split. At some point, Allah breathes into it of his spirit, and I am certain that He's the one who directs him. Okay, now I need a squad of y'all to go over here and develop the heart. I need another group of y'all to go ahead and develop the brain. Y'all become the ears. You become the eyes. You become the hands. You become the legs. Y'all make bones. So we structure our human biology. But we don't need any of that in the womb of the mother. So why did we develop all of that? Because we were preparing ourselves for the next dimension we're going to live in. So we die as that kind of life as an embryo in the womb of the mother. And we're born in the womb of Mother Earth. In the womb of Mother Earth, the same process begins again. We develop all of the body parts that we're going to need in the next dimension. And this is where the deaf angel is taking these little essence and making those cells. And that's where I'm going. I'm, I'm still talking about Hodge. I'm still talking about Earth. Right? And I'm telling you that the masculine and the feminine now are producing deeds of righteousness. They're producing deeds for the pleasure of Allah. And the deaf angel is taking themselves out as soon as we make them. That's the making of man. That's the Khalifa fill art. That's the Khalifa in the earth. That's the making of man. He didn't say, I made man in paradise. He said, I'm going to make man in the earth. We're being made. Hodge tells us this is how we are made. At least he tells me that. <laughs> so if you ask me that question, I'm telling you. That's the most important aspect. Perfect. But I don't see our effect like, like other people see it. I see it the way I'm telling it to you. And I hope you can see it too. We appreciate it the way you see it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Earlier you mentioned to construct the Kaaba in your heart. Yes. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Well, the Kaaba is known as as, and he, uh, this is the one time the imam corrected me when I wrote that, when I put the articles. <laughs> he did say one thing. He said we should not refer to the Kaaba as the house of Allah. We should refer to the, ha the Kaaba as the house built by Abraham and Ismael. So I'm glad you asked that question. I, I should have told you that because, because when, you know, when, when the imam says, when the imam chastised, you just chastised. I lost it. I, made it. I rewrote another article the next week and corrected it. But because the carpet was built by Abraham and Ismael, I'm going to highlight Abraham represents rational religious faith. If you look at how Abraham found the law, he went through a rationale. He, first, he took the moon for his God, took the stars for it, took the sun. But he finally concluded that the creator of all of these things was his God, which is Allah. 
Ismael represents faith because he never questioned when Abraham said, I see in a dream that I should sacrifice you. He said to hear is to obey. So we see that if Abraham and Ishmael built the physical Kaaba, we don't look at just two personalities, but we look at what these personalities represent in our human potential. So the Kaaba should be the focus by which we direct our attention to the worship of Allah. This is what we all practice. When we come into the masjid, we make salat, we turn towards the Kaaba. We, we, we call it the uh, Kibla. So, we should do so with the house that we build inside of us. With our rational religious understanding and our faith. I don't care if our faith is a baby, which is what Ishmael was. We should be about the business of constructing the Kaaba inside of us and focusing the tension towards the worship of Allah. Uh, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, don't everybody ask me to say what we think. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as Yeah, so um, you, you mentioned that you uh, went on the Hajj for the first time 41 years ago, but that you went a second time. Yes. How did you approach it differently? The second time you went, when you were much more knowledgeable about the meanings of the rights of Hajj. Okay, I'm glad you asked that question. I really am. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story about that second time. I have a son that was murdered 26 years ago. And he, he was Muslim. So I told my wife that I'm going to escort you on Hodge as your mock run, and I'm going to make Hodge for him. So the second time I went, I went, I made Hodge for him. And be true with you, I just was more interested in observing my wife because she had been studying hard with me for 37 years. <laughs> and I was more interested in the effects of her. And that's what we did. But the story I'm going to tell you is we were on Arafat. And she said, she gave me a phone call. We had cell phones this time. This was two years ago. She said, stop here. I'm in a room with a whole bunch of women. And um, I went outside and I, I saw some buses about two blocks down the street and one of them had a number eight on it. I said, well, I'm in a room with a bunch of guys. So uh, I come out and I go looking for where these buses are parked at. So finally I get to uh, the place where I see the buses and I look for the number eight on one of the buses and I did. So I looked, there was an hourway with some buildings at the end of that hourway. I walked down that building, down that down hourway, and I got, got down there and I saw the building. She was outside waiting. So I said, her name is Dale. I said, Dale, do you know what this means? She said, no, what it mean to you, Sophia? I said, this means that I can say I met my wife at Arafat. <laughs> <laughs> That was it. And uh, that was uh, really uh, the highlight of my life, <laughs> to tell you the truth. God said, I don't know one other person who did that. That was that. <laughs> um, but later on, when we came home, I asked, I said, Dale, I feel comfortable that I met my wife at Arafat. But I got a question for you. She said, what is that? I said, did you meet your husband? I said, and I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about your faith, your Iman. Did it get acquainted with the community of yourself? She said, yes. Why do you think I stopped arguing with you? <laughs> 
See, I turned you over to a lot. I got something for you. And so um, I just think that's a, a more practical way of putting it for the, for the males and the females. Uh, your faith should meet your desires and they should cohabitate in this earth as it is seeking the pleasure of Allah trying to earn its way back to paradise. F1. Uh, any more questions? Yes, so our goal is to please Allah. Yes. Our goal is to return to Allah. So we came from the heaven and we were born from the heaven. And our goal in this journey of life is to return to God pleasing God. Yes. And that represents our that's our fact. Say that again? Is that our fact? No, no, no. I'm going to say, I'm going to say that's the rest, that, that's, that's, uh, uh, the hitra, that's stone in the gym. Right? You see, let me, let, let me back up a minute. <laughs> because after Arafat, which is ninth of the hitra, we now go and stone the gym, right? The big gym, right? Just the big gym. Right? That's the first day, which is the tenth of the hitra, which is Idu Adha. Then the next three days, each day we go and stone all three Jimmerites. To me, what that is saying is, the rest of our lives, that's what we do. Resist the influence of Satan on every level. Seven levels within our Iman, within our rationale, and within the community of self. That's what Abraham, Ismael, and Hagar represents. So we should do that the rest of our lives. This is why I'm, I, I brought out that point about the death angel extracting the essence. Not when we expire in this world, but every thought we think, every deed we perform, every act. That's the reason why we make our niya. We make our intentions for the pleasure of Allah. We want that essence to be a cell in our body. Who in their right mind want to be born afflicted? Who wants to be born ill-formed? Well, the way you fashion yourself for the next life is to how you govern your faith and your desires now. Yes. You know now is no excuse. You don't want to be after birth when you go to the next life. You want to be prepared. You want to be able to walk, talk, use your eyes, use your senses, use your ears, everything else. Well, this is how we do it. By employing the rights of Hodge in our everyday lives. Any, any more? Uh, well, I would just like to say, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you. And um, I would just like to also represent myself as a student of Imam W.D. Muhammad, who is the source of uh, what we had because I, as my son told you earlier, we were followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad before we became a follower, a student of Imam W.D. Muhammad. And as a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he told us we didn't even have a soul. He said, when you're dead, you're dead. This is the end of it. Imam Muhammad was the one who introduced us to the development of our human potential and to prepare it for the day of judgment when we meet Allah. So I, I, I want to make sure that uh, proper credit is due to where it belongs. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. Yes, sir.
Did you say you had a question? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, uh, books are available. And, and uh, I don't know if Imam Shue was, was here, but what we're asking everybody to do is, is take a book and make a contribution to the Majesty. You can do that right here. <laughs> right. Oh, and, and I think the sister said, what is this? She, she like fo she like folding. <laughs> oh, she like the contribution that folds, not jingle. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, if we're online, excuse me, if we're online, thank you so much. If we're online, where would you prefer us to purchase the book? Would you want us to go online to get it? Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah, we thank our respected imam for his presentation. I'm sure it was enlightening for all of us. We have about 30 people, I think, online, or 20, in the high 20s, and maybe more. So, Hamilah, uh, we are was more there than they are here. So, Hamilah. So, we appreciate it. I have to say, I, I forgot to announce that Imam uh, Shuey, he was late because he had his class tonight. So, we had to finish his class before he got here. To let you know that it wasn't uh, out of neglect, it was because of obligation of, uh, to his students. Hamilah, so we're going to end. Uh, you have how many books? You got enough books for everybody? Yes. Okay, we have enough books for everybody. Okay. I need I need two. Some people have said to at least to give me two, please. And uh, we have some more food. We're going to make uh, salat al maghrib, inshallah, very very soon. What, what time? Is it? Seven fifteen. So yeah, white Islam. Hold on. Yes. So there was a question that came up. Teresa asked because we are online. Where can the people that are online, where can they purchase the book? Okay, where that, can the people who are online purchase the book? I think we will put you on... Uh, yes, but why don't you... Uh, if we can, why don't you go into the chat and put your name and say you want to purchase the book, and I'll give it to uh, Sister Nisa. And uh, uh, our Imam said, uh, and he's, uh, for the book, you should make a contribution to the master. So, uh, name yourself in the chat. And yes. Pardon? Oh, I, be quiet. Let me let me hear Sister Latifa say what? If they want to pay for their book, you want to make a donation? Yes. Oh yeah, if you want to if you want to send in the contribution for your book, you put your name in the chat saying I want a book. If you want to send in your contribution, you can do it on Vimmo on the Masjid Vimmo uh, at the at, at Vimmo address and then uh, indicate that it's for uh, the book in behalf of uh, Imam Safi Robs. Uh, the charity that uh, goes to her credit and his credit and the credit of the family, inshallah, now and later. Uh, we have anything else that we should say? How many we are, this, was a, this was a surprise appearance on a night which most of us be watching the, the uh, Monday night football game. But as I said, we got a double treat tonight. How many And it's better than that that game uh, that we would have been seeing. There's more food here. We have, have we got all the food? Is all the food distributed? Did we need to give it anyway? We have, we have more food. Please take it so we yeah, won't so we won't have to uh, try to distribute it uh, after tonight and we don't want to have to store it. Inshallah. So we'll uh, in a couple of minutes we'll make the dance. It's time. It's time. Inshallah we make the dan and then we'll have uh, the Maghrib prayer, inshallah. All right. Salaamu Alaikum, all our attendees. Put, your, put your, your name in the chat. We'll hold it open. And then I'll give it to Nisa, and he will, uh, she will uh, put a book to the side for you. And inshallah, there'll be some. Hopefully, they won't be here in Maghrib. Uh, and maybe we'll get the Imam's name uh, and his contact information. We can send off for them in case they're all uh, accounted for tonight.
So I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna leave the, the Zoom open so you can do that uh, for up until the end of the Margaret prayer. We'll just leave it open. Put your name in, and then she'll be able to take those names off. So Subhana Rabbi Rabbi Yisrael Amaya Sifuna Salamu Alaihi Wasallam Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Mm -hmm.